Good evening. Well, we made it. Bad rush from the airport. And uh, I'm glad that we have a large number of uh, young people from our school here. And I'm really excited. Glad that you came out. Welcome to the 2017 Highlands Latin School Community Lecture Series. This annual lecture exists to promote the academic and aesthetic values of the Christian West. It also exists to energize and compel young people to apply themselves in the urgent need to think and act in accord with a classical Christian worldview. This year, our guest speaker is Professor Michael Ward. Professor Ward is Senior Research Fellow at Blackfriars Hall, University of Oxford, he is also Professor of Apologetics at Houston Baptist University. He holds degrees in English from the University of Oxford, in Theology from the University of Cambridge, and a PhD in Divinity from the University of St. Andrews. He's the author of the award-winning Planet Narnia, The Seven Heavens and the Imagination of C.S. Lewis, which is available for purchase tonight, if we have any left. And he's the co-editor of the Cambridge Companion to C.S. Lewis. From time to time in academia, a scholar puts forth a thesis which advances the study of a given subject very far and quickly. Professor Ward has done this in Planet Narnia. <laughs> the explanatory power of his thesis, the wide support of his analysis from the corpus of C.S. Lewis's writings, and the logic of his masterful argument explaining the composition, the occasion, and the reception of the Chronicles of Narnia. This evening, Professor Ward has graciously accepted our invitation to speak about Planet Narnia. Please join me in welcoming, wel welcoming him to the podium. Uh, we actually pulled up outside the school about 10 minutes ago. Uh, this is the very first talk I've ever given in my life when I've been unshaved. <laughs> I was going to have a nice afternoon at the hotel and shower and prepare myself. And, and here I am instead, fresh from the car. <laughs> but thank you very much for coming. Uh, whoops, uh, I've already destroyed the PowerPoint presentation. Um, <laughs> Yes, Matt, uh, when he came and kindly picked me up from the airport, said, oh, it doesn't matter, there'll only be 50 people there, they won't mind if, if, if we're late. Um, and I'm very pleased to see such a, a large crowd. Thank you very much. Uh, what's happening here? Everything is going wrong today. Uh, come on. There we go, right. When troubles come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. <laughs> uh, good. <clears throat> Seven Chronicles of Narnia. Can I quickly survey the assembled throng and ask you how many of you here have read at least one of these books or seen at least one of the movies? Wow, <laughs> a veritable forest of hands. Uh, is anybody not putting up their hand? <laughs> don't be afraid, don't be ashamed. Really? Everybody? One? <laughs> really? Come on, you can be honest. <laughs> Excellent. So 100% success rate. Marvellous. Uh, there are not many books or series of books which you could ask such a large crowd about and get 100% uh, positive response rate. Uh, like with the Narnia Chronicles. They were published one per year from 1950 to 1956. And they're still selling incredibly well. I'm told maybe as many as 3 million copies annually, 
worldwide in over 40 different languages. And the recent film adaptations of the first three books have introduced them to a whole new generation of readers. Uh, though if you ask me, the less said about those films, the better. <laughs> I'm told they're working on an adaptation of The Silver Chair as a fourth film. Uh, we'll see how they do with that. Um, but I want to talk about the books and why Lewis wrote them the way that he did. Because although they are very popular and very widely enjoyed, uh, not many people have, have seriously studied them and ask why it is that Lewis wrote them the way that he did. Because we get caught up in our enjoyment of, the, of these stories, and we, we tend to think that they were inevitably going to be this way. We don't reflect upon all the choices, all the imaginative decisions that Lewis took in order to make them the way that they are. And when he read aloud the first few chapters of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe to his great friend, J.R.R.R.R. Tolkien, <laughs> you, you know that Lewis and Tolkien are good friends. Uh, when Tolkien heard the first few chapters of the first book, he, he strongly reacted against what he was hearing. He couldn't understand why Lewis was throwing together seemingly incompatible literary traditions and, and mythological traditions. English children, centaurs and fauns and dryads and naiads from Greek and, or Roman mythology, a, a snow queen straight out of a Hans Anderson fairy tale, Father Christmas, for goodness sake, what's he doing in this story? <laughs> Tolkien thought this was a mishmash and a hodgepodge, and he soon gave up trying to read the books after Lewis began to publish them. He later confessed that they were entirely outside his range of imaginative sympathy. <laughs> a polite way of saying he didn't like them. Uh, Lewis and Tolkien had a love-hate relationship. That is to say, Lewis loved The Lord of the Rings. Tolkien hated Narnia. <laughs> um, seriously, he, he strongly detested. The, the, I'm quoting here from George Sayer, who knew both Lewis and Tolkien for 30 years. Tolkien strongly detested the way Lewis had apparently thrown this story together from all sorts of incompatible traditions. And because Tolkien has become so famous, his attitude to Narnia has become very well known too. And lots of people have thought that Tolkien knew the series much better than he actually did. If Tolkien had paused to reflect upon this situation, I think he would have seen how very uncharacteristic it would have been of C.S. Lewis to do anything without any rhyme or reason without careful patterning and structuring, because Lewis was not a, a typically slapdash or random writer or thinker. He, he was a very rigorous and consistent thinker who had good reason for everything he did and said. His own poetry is fantastically complex. Lewis once said that he was enamored of metrical and phonetic subtleties. The poems which look as if they're in free verse are often in the most complicated meters of all. His love of medieval literature caused him to say that medieval writers love to present us with something which can't be taken in at a glance. Everything leads to everything else in medieval literature, but often by very intricate paths. These writers, he said, love to present us with something which at first looks planless, though all is planned. And as a Christian, too, Lewis believed that the universe itself is a fantastically intricate work of divine artistry. Every single thing in creation having been made for a, a, a specific purpose. We, mere creatures, we may not be able to work out what that purpose is, and sometimes we doubt that there can be uh, a, a good and benevolent God in control of the world when we see all sorts of odd things happening, disasters occurring, innocent people suffering, inexplicable events. Can there really be a divine author behind this universe? Well, Lewis thought that though we can't always see God's purposes, there are divine purposes working themselves out. Down to the curve of every wave and the flight of every insect, as he puts it in his book on prayer, there are, finally speaking, when all is said and done, from God's point of view, Finally, no true, mere accidents. So when you look at Lewis's complex poetry, when you look at his love of complex medieval literature, when you look at his beliefs about God's complex act of creation, and turn back to Narnia, and it is supposedly a hodgepodge, a mishmash, thrown together any old how, you've got a real case of cognitive dissonance here. These two things do not line up. 
And lots of Lewis scholars and critics have pointed this out and, and said, there must be a, an additional level of significance. It, it may not make much sense at the purely literary level, but surely at the, at the biblical level, there is a, a, a sense of coherence and design. Lewis once said that the whole Narnia series is about Christ. The whole Narnia series, he said, is about Christ. And the Christ character, Aslan, the Lion King, is indeed the only character who appears in all seven books. And he is very Christ-like, particularly in these three stories, where we have in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe a Narnian gospel story. In The Magician's Nephew, we have a Narnian creation story. And in The Last Battle, we have a Narnian uh, final judgment. The biblical parallels in these three books are very clear and obvious. You can't miss them if you've got any biblical knowledge at all. But these are only three out of seven books. This is less than half the series. What's going on in the other four? Aslan is still present, and he's still Christ-like in various ways, guiding people, teaching people, the center of each story. But there's no major element or episode of Christ's life or ministry that Lewis seems to be reimagining in these four books. You might, have imagined, you might have expected Lewis to give us a whole Narnia story about, say, the birth of Aslan as a lion cub into Narnia like Jesus is born into Bethlehem as a baby. But you don't get that. You don't get a Narnian equivalent of the ascension of Christ. You don't get a Narnian equivalent of the day of Pentecost when Christ sends his spirit on the church. And Perhaps you would have expected Lewis to do that sort of thing, given what he has done in these three. But in these four, what do you get? In Prince Caspian, you have Aslan entering the story amongst dancing trees before giving a great war cry. In the Dawn Treader, Aslan is seen scattering light from his mane at the eastern edge of the world, and Lucy earlier has seen him flying in a sunbeam. In the silver chair, Aslan doesn't actually come down to Narnia at all. He's confined to his own high country above the clouds, which doesn't seem a particularly Christian way of depicting your Christ character. If he's not incarnated into the magical world but is confined to a sort of heaven, that would be more like an Old Testament way of depicting your divine character. And in The Horse and His Boy, Aslan is mistaken for two lions, or maybe three lions, and he does a great deal of dashing about in that story. You may remember he says there was only one lion, but he was swift of foot. So why did Lewis make the decision in this book to depict Aslan as swift of foot? I don't recall Jesus in the New Testament being described as a notable sprinter <laughs> or, or having a special ministry to athletes. So why did Lewis make that imaginative choice? You don't ask these questions while you're caught up in the story, but it's worth reflecting upon them when we're gathered together for an event like this to try to work out what Lewis is really up to. Because, as I've already said, he loved intricacy and complexity of all kinds. He loved literature which at first looks planless, though all is planned. He wrote poems which look as if they're in free verse, but are in the most complicated meters of all. So when we turn to the Narnia Chronicles from this biblical point of view, trying to find some sort of intricacy, coherence, design, well, perhaps we do a little bit better than when we're just considering them from the literary point of view, but we still don't have an overarching, uh, um, particularly evident, imaginative blueprint that Lewis seems to be working to. So what is there that, hack, that, that ties these books together, if anything? Quite a lot of Lewis scholars and critics have attempted to find a third level of explanatory power within these books, and all sorts of different theories have been suggested. The Seven Deadly Sins, for instance. Two different scholars came up with that idea independently of each other. Lewis is known to have written an essay, a poem on the Seven Deadly Sins, so perhaps that provides the key. The only problem for that is that uh, these two scholars assigned different sins to different books. Uh, so that theory didn't get very far. Another scholar has suggested maybe the seven Catholic sacraments, overlooking the fact that Lewis wasn't a Catholic. He was an Anglican, and Anglicans have two sacraments, not seven. So that theory didn't get very far. I myself made a half-hearted attempt to link the Chronicles to different plays by Shakespeare. 
because there are lots of Shakespearean allusions in the series too. But although that worked reasonably well for three or four of the books, it didn't work so well for the remaining ones, and I ended up having to sort of twist the books and to crowbar them into this scheme that I had devised. Uh, and it was when I wasn't looking for it that I believe I stumbled across the real answer to this imaginative puzzle that the Narnia Chronicles present us with. I was halfway through my PhD at the time. I was looking at Lewis's theological imagination. I wasn't particularly focusing on Narnia. But one night, I was lying in bed reading a poem that Lewis wrote about the planets when an idea occurred to me. And I'll come back to that idea later on. I told my PhD supervisors the thought that I'd had. They said, that sounds interesting. You should write that up. So I refocused the whole of my doctoral research, finished, published the thesis as this book, Planet Narnia, with Oxford University Press a few years ago. Then the BBC got interested and commissioned a television documentary about it called The Narnia Code. Please excuse the terrible title. Uh, this has got nothing to do with the Da Vinci Code. This is serious scholarship. Uh, well, I believe it is. Uh, I'm sure it'd be interested to see what you make of it. Um, it is a very big claim that I'm making that Lewis had a secret imaginative blueprint to the Narnia Chronicles, which he told nobody about, not even close friends like Tolkien, and which nobody else spotted for 50 or more years until I came along and spotted it myself. <laughs> I mean, how arrogant do I think I am? Uh, if anybody came to me with such a claim, I think I would be very skeptical. But I hope I would also have the patience to listen to the arguments and the evidence. And um, once you begin to look at the evidence, it begins to stack up pretty surprisingly. I mean, I was surprised myself. I wasn't trying to force the books into this scheme like I had been with my Shakespeare play theory. When this idea occurred to me, it just fell into place with a satisfying click. And the links just lit up all over Lewis's writings, not just the Narnia Chronicles, but his work in general. So it's, it's the basic argument of these two books that I want to introduce you to tonight. Uh, but before we come on to the substance of the, of the argument itself, I want to give you four background reasons why Lewis might be expected to do such a thing, even before we come on to the argument itself. Once we've got these four background <laughs> building blocks in place, I hope it will seem less implausible that he could have done such a thing. So the first of these four background reasons has to do with Lewis himself and his own personality. He could be very secretive when he wanted to be. Jack never ceased to be secretive. That's the verdict of George Sayer, who knew him for 30 years. You know, by the way, that he was called Jack by his friends. I mean, his actual initials are Clive Staples, but he didn't like the name Clive. Um, who would want to be known as a, as a small metallic stationary product. Um, so Staples wasn't ever his name either. Everyone called him Jack. Jack never ceased to be secretive. Uh, if we're looking for examples of his secretiveness, the most obvious is the fact that when he got married in his late 50s, he kept his marriage secret for the best part of the year. Have you seen the film Shadowlands? Do you know about this? He got married and told nobody about it. Not even close friends like Tolkien. It was a secret wedding. A man who can keep his marriage secret can keep anything secret. Uh, but there are plenty of other examples, too, of his secretive personality. He, he wrote an autobiography, Surprised by Joy, which left out so many important things that one of his friends said, Jack, you should not have called this Surprised by Joy. You should have called it Suppressed by Jack. <laughs> So this is the kind of man we're dealing with. He could keep secrets when he wanted to. So from that sort of uh, temperamental or psychological background point, we turn to our second background point, which has to do with theology, and this verse from the letter to the Colossians. For all things were created through Christ, and for Christ, and in Christ, all things hold together. <laughs> Lewis was interested in this verse. He paraphrased it in one of his books as Christ is the all-pervasive principle of cohesion whereby the universe holds together. Christ is the all-pervasive principle of cohesion whereby the universe holds together. 
Now remember, he says that the whole Narnia series is about Christ. And when we hear Lewis say that, we tend to think immediately of Aslan, the incarnate Christ figure, the, the, the localized divine representative. We tend not to think of this Christological truth, the idea of Christ as the Logos that has brought all things into being and, and in whom all things hold together. That Christological or theological truth is a much harder thing for an author like C.S. Lewis to depict in a story, because this would have to be all pervasive. This would have to be in every part of the story at once, not just localized in the representative figure. How would Lewis do this if he was going to try? It's a very difficult thing, not, even, not just to depict, but even to conceptualize, because if all things hold together in Christ, then our very understanding of Christ holds together in Christ. We can't, in that sense, step outside Christ and look back at him as if from some Christ-less point of view. There is no such point of view, because all things hold together in Christ. To try to find a Christless vantage point would be to step into the folly. We can't do that. Lewis homes in on this predicament that we find ourselves in, in his book Miracles, where he says, the fact which is in one respect the most obvious and primary fact, and through which alone you have access to all the other facts, may be precisely the one that's most easily forgotten. Forgotten not because it's so remote and abstruse, but because it's so near and so obvious. And that is exactly how the supernatural has been forgotten. The divine nature is closer to us than we are to ourselves. We know God before we know anything else whatsoever. And because of that, because God in this sense is the, the, the ground of our very being, the, the, the presupposed truth that gives us access to all the other truths, for that very fact it can be overlooked. So how would Lewis depict an all-pervasive but overlookable divine presence? Keep that question in mind. Our third background point is the Kappa element in romance. This is the title of an essay Lewis wrote, and Kappa means, well, it's the initial letter of the Greek word krypton, which means cryptic or hidden. And romance here means a, a story, not, not a love affair. Lewis wrote an essay called The Hidden Element in Story. This should alert us to the possibility that there may be more going on in Narnia than meets the eye. The, the only problem is that he never published this essay under this title, and most people don't know that it exists. It exists in note form, and he later wrote up those notes uh, under a different title, On Stories. And in On Stories, he says this, to be stories at all, stories must be series of events. But it must be understood that this series, the plot as we call it, is only really a net whereby to catch something else. The real theme may be, and perhaps usually is, something that has no sequence in it, something other than a process, and much more like a state or a quality. Now, there are stories which are all plot and no atmosphere. Think of your typical Agatha Christie whodunit murder mystery. Very carefully plotted book. You read it to find out who did the murder. Once you've found out that, you have really got everything that Agatha Christie has to offer you. You tend not to read Agatha Christie more than once. But a great novel, like Pride and Prejudice, say, you will read dozens of times in the course of your life. Not because you've forgotten the plot, you can remember well enough that Elizabeth Bennet marries Mr. Darcy. I'm sorry if that's a spoiler for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you don't read the book in order to find out what happens, because you can remember that well enough. You read, you reread the book in order to enjoy being in that world. You like the Austin world. You like breathing that atmosphere, because Jane Austen is a great novelist, and she gives us not just the sequence of events, but a whole three-dimensional, believable world in which we can live and breathe as we read, and we just like going to that place, imaginatively speaking. But the interesting thing is that while you're in the story, while you're living the story, you're not reflecting upon the Austin world. 
you are inside the Austen world. I mean, you might close the book and reflect upon how very cleverly Jane Austen did that particular thing on that particular page in order to generate that atmosphere. But while you're, you know, while you're in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the moment, you don't think those thoughts. Therefore, the atmosphere is effectively hidden from you by virtue of the fact that you're inside it. Just like the divine presence in the real world is effectively overlookable because we are inside it. If you want to hide something, put it in the open. Put it where people will walk past it every day of their lives, they'll never give it a second glance. So that's our third background point, the kappa element in romance. And now fourthly, transferred classicism. This is a term that Lewis coined when he was writing a review of the Oxford Book of Christian Verse. And he's talking about how Christian poets, up until as late as the 17th century, would, when they're writing their Christian poetry, their Christian plays, they would actually fill their Christian literature with classical characters. They would reach back into the classical mythological past, ancient Greece and Rome, and they would find their certain characters like Zeus or Jupiter or Venus or Apollo, they would transfer those characters into their Christian literature and talk about Christian themes, but by means of classical paganism. And everyone was in the secret, Lewis says. Everybody knew that this was what was going on. And this is indeed the best way, Lewis says, of talking about uh, religious themes which uh, can be explored imaginatively, but not necessarily devotionally. God, the Christian God, Lewis says, will often appear in medieval literature, but masked, dressed up as Jupiter or Apollo or whoever it may be. God will appear, but incognito. And in a sense, what Lewis is talking about here has a kind of scriptural precedent in what we find St. Paul doing in the book of Acts, when he quotes pagan poets. Remember, Paul says, God is not far from each one of us, for... In him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your poets have said, we are indeed his offspring. And Paul is here quoting, I'm told, Aratus and Epimenides, two Greek poets who were writing poems about Zeus. And the original said, in Zeus we live and have, move and have our being, for we are indeed Zeus's offspring. Now, of course, St. Paul isn't advising the Athenians to start worshipping Zeus. But he's just using the Athenian understanding of God in order to transfer it into his presentation of the gospel so that he can make some headway, so he can make some traction. And that's somewhat similar, not exactly the same, but similar to what the medieval writers would do later on by exploiting pagan uh, tropes, pagan characters uh, for Christian ends. Transfer of classicism. Okay. Now we're back where we started, the Narnia Chronicles, and how they hold together if they do. Let's just very quickly recap what we have seen. We have seen that Lewis could be secretive. We've seen that he had a belief in God's overlookable omnipresence. We've seen that there's a literary equivalent of that in the Kappa element, the all-pervasive flavor or atmosphere of a well-told tale, which you don't see because you're inside it. And then we saw how God could be hidden behind a pagan veil. Now we are better placed to understand what he might be up to in the Narnia Chronicles. And at this point, we need to remind ourselves that although he's best known for Narnia, he wasn't professionally a writer of fiction. He was professionally an academic who taught at Oxford for 30 years and specialized in books like this, English literature in the 16th century excluding drama. A uh, snappy type, if ever there was one. Uh, it was part of this multi volume series of books called The Oxford History of English Literature. Lewis abbreviated Oxford History of English Literature, literature to. <coughs> oh, hell. <laughs> this was his Oh, hell volume. Uh, it took him 15 years to write this book. And uh, when he published it in 1954, he wrote to a friend and said, thank goodness I finished this big academic enterprise I've been engaged in for the last decade and a half. And then he adds, interestingly, this was the top tune all that time. And all the other books I published during those 15 years were just its little twiddly bits. Which means that Narnia, as far as Lewis is concerned, or at least the early Narnia books, 
were just the little twiddly bits upon this massive intellectual undertaking. This is the top tune. This is the main theme. This is what Lewis was paid to think about. This was his career. If we think of him principally as the author of Narnia, and only secondarily as the writer of this kind of book, we get it completely back to front. We mistake the top tune for the twiddly bits. I asked you how many of you had read Narnia. How many of you have read this book? <laughs> Anybody? I expect an English professor or two, if we have them here, might, might know it. A little bit, yeah. Uh, Matt was telling me in the car, but he, he began reading it. Um, it is worth reading, actually. Um, and if ever you do read it, you'll find that it opens with a long discussion of this chap, Nicholas Copernicus, who, slap bang in the middle of the 16th century, revolutionized astronomy with his theory of the heliocentric cosmos. And Lewis was interested in this because Obviously, the kind of cosmos that you believe yourself to be living in will have a major effect upon the kinds of literature that you write. Because, you know, the, the, the universe that you believe yourself to be living in will be the backdrop, the, the presupposed backdrop against which you tell all your tales. That's why he starts by talking about astronomy. Copernicus is kind of a big deal. <laughs> it's a theme that he returns to in his last academic book, uh, The Discarded Image. In this book, he uh, three times asks his readers to take a walk under the sky at night and to look up at the night sky as if they still believed in the pre-Copernican universe, as if they still believed that the Earth was static and central. These days, in the 21st century, when you look up at the night sky, you, you think you're looking up into empty space. But that word space would not have been available to you before the time of Copernicus. It's a 17th century word. You would have felt that you were looking up not into space, but into the heavens. Earth was static and central, and it was surrounded by concentric spheres, each sphere with its own planet, and each planet with its own influences that it would shed upon the Earth, and upon people and events, and even the metals in Earth's crust. And these are the seven heavens. The Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. These are the seven planets, the seven wandering stars, that can be seen with the naked eye. This is before the discovery of Uranus or Neptune, let alone the ill-fated Pluto, <laughs> which has recently been relegated to the status of a dwarf planet. Uh, and Pluto's recent relegation reminds us that planets come and planets go, as as astronomy develops, and our image of the cosmos is not fixed. It's always developing as new information comes to light. And this is how it was believed to be for centuries, millennia, until Copernicus revolutionized astronomy. These are the seven wandering stars, and all the other stars are fixed in their constellations. This is a slightly more detailed diagram of that cosmos as it was believed to be. This is the image that we have discarded. But not in every respect, because of course it's from these seven heavens that we take the names of the days of the week. What is today, Tuesday? Martes in Spanish, the day of Mars. And so on for the other six. We have largely discarded it, but C.S. Lewis had not discarded it at all, because it was his professional job to keep alive an understanding of that old cosmos uh, in his students' minds, so that they would understand the literature of the period. In particular, uh, the writings of Dante. Here's an illustration from Dante's Divine Comedy. In the Divine Comedy, the pilgrim melts up through the seven heavens, doesn't he, in the, in the Paradiso? And here are the seven planetary gods and goddesses in the order of the days of the week. The sun for Sunday, the moon in her silvery gown for Monday, Tuesday, Mars for Martes in his helmet and his chain mail, the god of war. This is Mercury for Mercules, Wednesday. We know he's Mercury because of, you see those wings on his heels there. Mercury the messenger, swift of foot. Then we come to Jupiter. That, that rod over his shoulder there is not just any old stick, it's, it's the kingly scepter 
the, the sign of, of, of royal monarchical authority because Jupiter was above all things the king, symbolically, in medieval thought. Here we come to Venus for Thursday, so for Friday, VNAs. Think of the word venerate. When you venerate someone, you lovingly respect them because Venus is exerting her loving influence through you. She was associated with love and fertility and creativity. And finally, we come to Saturn. You see there his sickle, his scythe. Saturn was associated with death and disaster, cutting people down in their prime. So Dante uses these uh, seven heavens very explicitly in the Divine Comedy. And another author that Lewis writes about is Chaucer. This is a page of notes that I found in Lewis's handwriting. Um, if you look at the ceiling, you can just... <laughs> <laughs> it says, Planetary Hours, The Knight's Tale, from the Canterbury Tales. And, uh, and Lewis was interested in the way that Chaucer used the planets in the, in the Knight's Tale. He didn't just put them as actors into the story, but he, he wove the appropriate influences into the plot so that the climax of the Knight's Tale happens on a Tuesday, on Martes. How appropriate for a story about night. So Lewis has this detailed scholarly awareness of how pre-Copernican literature depended upon this cosmology, but he also responded to it more personally. He was quite a keen amateur astronomer. He uh, had a telescope on the balcony of his bedroom. He liked going to the local observatory. He would often point out unusual conjunctions of the planets in the night sky. We know this from his letters. And he also responded to the heavens more spiritually and devotionally. He loved Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims his handiwork. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Those are the opening four verses of Psalm 19. And Lewis described that 19th psalm as the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the finest lyrics in the world. An academic interest, a private hobby interest, a devotional interest, an imaginative interest, because of course he wrote a trilogy of interplanetary novels. The Cosmic Trilogy, sometimes called the Space Trilogy or the Ransom Trilogy. The first book is set on Mars, the second book is set on Venus, and in the third book, the planetary powers actually come down to Earth to bring about the end of the story. Why was Lewis so interested in this old scheme? He said this, the characters of the planets seem to me to have a permanent value as spiritual symbols, which is especially worthwhile in our own generation. Of Saturn, we know more than enough, but who does not need to be reminded of Job, Jupiter? Now, this is a very important quotation for my argument. We see here that Lewis is not just describing the planets as a medieval curiosity. He's saying they have a permanent, continuing value in the modern imagination. Indeed, they are especially worthwhile, he says, in his own generation, because his own generation was the generation that went through the First World War. Lewis himself had been a teenage officer in the Great War and had been very nearly killed. Three quarters of a million British servicemen were killed in the 1914-18 war. That's why he says of Saturn, we know more than enough. We know more than enough about the figure with his sickle, cutting people down, bringing about death and disaster. But Lewis thought that the universe was not Saturnocentric. He uses that word in various places. Saturn and the spiritual qualities of Saturn are not the ultimate reality about this universe. We can't avoid Saturn. We will all have to suffer and die. But there are other ways of looking at reality too. Principally, through the symbolism of Jove, Jupiter, the best planet, the kingly planet, the tranquil, festive, prosperous, magnanimous planet. You can conceive of reality through jovial terms, and not just Saturnine terms. And indeed, you have five other options as well. 
That's why these seven symbols are so valuable in his own generation, because they remind you that you have different ways of perceiving reality. It doesn't have to be Saturnocentric. So when Lewis came to write the Narnia Chronicles, I believe he used these seven spiritual symbols again. He used them explicitly in his trilogy. He'd written about them explicitly in his academic works and in a good deal of his poetry, too. Here, in Narnia, he uses them implicitly. He uses them secretly, tacitly. He takes one planet per book, and he turns its pervasive attributes and qualities into the story, so that it controls the plot, yes, but not just the sequence of events, because a good tale will be more than a sequence of events. It will also be an atmosphere generated, a tone, a quality, a flavor. And that's what Lewis does in each book. So that, yes, the plot takes on the, the planetary characteristics, but so does the portrayal of Aslan, the Christ character. And indeed, the way the children interact with the Christ character. And indeed, all sorts of incidental and ornamental details as well. Now, we don't have time to uh, go through all seven books, but Let's just very quickly look at the first three books in the order of publication. And that means we start with Jupiter. Here is Jupiter, the planet. Here in the southeast corner, you can just make out the, the great red eye of Jupiter, the great spot of Jupiter, which is a storm perpetually raging on the surface of Jupiter. Uh, here is the... Uh, the king of the gods, Jupiter in Roman mythology, or Zeus in Greek mythology, Thor in Norse mythology. Now, I told you earlier that I was halfway through my PhD researches when I was lying in bed one night reading a poem that Lewis wrote about the planets when an idea occurred to me. I was uh, just about to turn off the light and go to sleep when I read these lines about Jupiter, of wrath ended and woes mended, of winter past and guilt forgiven, and good fortune, Jove is master. Ha! Huh, I said to myself. Winter past and guilt forgiven? That's like a five-word summary of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which is all about the passing of winter and the forgiving of guilt. You remember how the White Witch has made it always winter, but never Christmas, and how Edmund, the traitor, is forgiven his sin. So I look more closely about the symbolism of Jupiter, and a great deal of the jovial imagery that Lewis writes about in so many other places seems to link up strangely well with the imagery of the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Principally kingliness. We've seen the scepter in that image, and we know that Jupiter is the king. Remember how Aslan is introduced in the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. The children in this first book don't know who he is. They think he might be a regular man, but they're told he's not a man, he's the king of the wood. That's the very first description given of him. He's not safe, but he's good. He's the king. And we're told later that he's got all these kingly accoutrements. He's got a royal standard, a royal crown, a royal pavilion. <coughs> and he ends up crowning the children. And he declares to the children, once a king in Narnia, always a king in Narnia. Once a queen in Narnia, always a queen in Narnia. The children themselves become monarchical as the story progresses. OK, we've got the passing of winter. We've got the kingly theme. The forgiving of guilt, though, what? how does that relate? Interestingly, in the same year that Lewis began writing The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe in earnest, he, he wrote another book on the poetry of his great friend, Charles Williams, who was one of the Inklings. And in that book, Lewis says this, when Charles Williams writes of Jupiter's red pierced planet, he assumes that the huge reddish spot which astronomers observe on the surface of Jupiter is a wound, and the redness is that of blood. Jupiter, the planet of kingship, thus wounded, becomes another ectype, another reflection of the divine king wounded on Calvary. 
So this shows us that Lewis very explicitly connects jovial symbolism with the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, which, of course, he's reworking at the heart of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe in the, in the death and resurrection of Aslan. This episode is not just a convenient Sunday school lesson to introduce young readers to the themes of sacrifice. It's part and parcel of the total jovial atmosphere which the book is designed to communicate. Here's a medieval woodcut showing you Jupiter enthroned in the heavens, and down on Earth are the people who exhibit the jovial influence. So there you see a coronation just about to happen, a man about to be made a king. Here on the middle, on the left, you can see another man kneeling for judgment. Is his guilt going to be forgiven or not? And in the background, I hope you can just make out horses and hounds they're off hunting the white stag, the white heart, that kings and queens would hunt for in medieval romances. And you may recall that the final chapter of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is entitled The Hunting of the White Stag. Wherever we look in this first book, we find a strange amount of jovial influence exerting itself. But you might say that because Lewis was so steeped in all this imagery that it just arose unbidden to his mind, that it was almost accidental. And for the sake of argument, let's grant that point. But when we turn to Prince Caspian, we find that this is a strangely martial book. Mars makes his influence felt all over this story. Principally in the uh, military events, because Prince Caspian is a war story, and if you saw the recent film version, you may remember how they went to town on the battles. <laughs> the word martial itself appears several times in Prince Caspian, but never again in any of the other Narnia books. But you might say there are battles in certain other of the Narnia Chronicles, so why would this be a peculiarly martial story? Well, it's partly the centrality of those military events. But what clinches it, actually, has nothing to do with battles, but everything to do with trees. You see the trees here on the cover of the book. Uh, perhaps you remember how Lucy tries to wake the trees and the trees come to the battle at the end of the book. Why all these trees? Is it just evidence of Lewis throwing the story together any old how? Hodgepodge, mishmash, like Tolkien <coughs> supposed? Well, I had no knowledge of this, because my own classical education is very weak. But as soon as I began digging, I found out very quickly indeed that Mars, in Roman mythology, was not always and only the god of war. He was originally the god of woods. He was known as Mars Silvanus. And here's a, wood, uh, here's a mural from Pompeii showing you Mars in both capacities at once. So he's, he's the god of war. Yes, he's got his spear and his shield and his helmet. But he's standing against a backdrop of burgeoning vegetation. He was known as Mars Silvanus. And here in an image from Prince Caspian, we see both elements, the, the warring aspect and the woodland aspect in a single picture. The single combat in the, in the foreground, and in the background you can see the gathering trees. Lewis calls them dryads and hammer dryads and sylvans. Only in Prince Caspian are the tree spirits called sylvans, because this is the Mars Sylvanus spirit making itself felt. Not in a pagan way, but through the governance of Aslan himself, who becomes in this book the true Mars. He utters the great war cry, but he's also the one in whose presence the trees come alive. And the boys harden into knights as they come to love and respect and obey Aslan, and the girls romp in the bacchanalian revelry with the swaying trees and the growing vines. Boys and girls take on the martial properties themselves as the story progresses. And even seemingly random little details help generate the atmosphere. You may recall that right at the start of the story, the children discover a discarded chess piece in the ruins of the castle. Now, this chess piece is totally unimportant. It could have been an un unspecified chess piece. It could have been a chess bishop, a chess pawn. But what is it? A chess knight with a little red ruby eye. It has to be a chess knight. <coughs> Because knighthood, gallantry, chivalry, 
All things martial are the inner meaning of this story. It has to be a chess night just as Chaucer's Knight's Tale had to conclude on a Tuesday. The Voyage of the Dawn Treader is the sun story. You could guess it's really from the title of the book alone because this is a story about a journey to the eastern edge of the world and the ship ends up treading the dawn. And this is why at the eastern edge of the world they encounter Aslan scattering light from his mane. This is why Lucy has seen Aslan flying in the sunbeam towards her. This is why they come across the, the island with the magic pool that turns things to gold, because gold is the sun's metal. This is why Aslan is described at one point as shining as if in bright sunlight, though the sun had in fact gone in. Because Aslan in this story is the true sun. He's the, you might say, the light of the world, to use a, a very biblical term. What clinches it, though, is not all this imagery to do with sunlight and gold, but imagery to do with dragons and the defeat of dragons. The ship itself is shaped like a dragon. Eustace, you may remember, is turned into a dragon. They meet the great sea serpent. There are several other dragons, too, when you begin to look. Why all these dragons? Is it evidence of Lewis just swapping the story together any old now? Mishmash, hodgepodge? Again, I didn't know this because, as I say, my classical education is weak. But as soon as I began researching, it soon became apparent that in Greek mythology, the god of light is Apollo, and Apollo was famously a slayer of dragons. This is an image of Apollo. He's looking at that miniature dragon, that lizard, and he's killing it with the beams from his eyes. If you know your Homer, Homer's hymn to Apollo is all about the killing of a dragon. Now here is a still from the recent terrible film version. <laughs> this is Eustace's eyeball, when Eustace has been turned into the dragon. And there you can just make out the reflection of Aslan. He's going to come and rip off the dragon skin and turn Eustace back into a boy again. Because Aslan in this story is the true Apollo, the true god of light. Everything in the story is cohering around this theme. That's the imaginative blueprint. Let me just list the remaining four books. The Silver Chair is the moon story, full of silver, the moon's metal, full of wetness and wanderings and lunacy. The Horse and His Boy is the Mercury story, full of running, racing, swift of foot characters, words, language, boxing, theft, twins, a whole matrix of mercurial qualities. This is why Aslan is swift of foot in this story, because he's the true Mercury. He's the divine word, living and active, to use biblical terms. And Lewis could have got all these images from, di directly from the Bible. We've seen the light of the world. Under Mars, he could have talked about the Lord of hosts, mighty in battle. Under Jupiter, he could have talked about the King of kings and Lord of lords. All this symbolism is to be found in the scriptures, but Lewis doesn't just start and stop with the scriptures. He starts in the biblical foundation, yes, but he goes a long way round through classical mythology and medieval cosmology, enriching this biblical symbolism as he goes before returning to a fully scriptural conclusion. The magician's nephew is the, the Venus story, full of... <coughs> Fertility, creativity, life, laughter, love, uh, beautiful women, uh, western gardens full of life-giving apples, and so on and so forth. And the last battle is the Saturn story, a story in which all the characters who are alive at the start are dead by the end. And who is it who brings Narnia to an end in this story but Father Time? This is a statue of Father Time in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. <coughs> and in an early draft of the Narnia Chronicles, <coughs> Lewis had chosen to call this character not Father Time, but the god Saturn. It's there in the draft. By the time he came to publish the books, he thought, calling this character the god Saturn is giving the game away too much. Let's call him Father Time and bank on people not knowing that they are the same character mythologically speaking. Now, if this theory is correct, 
Why would Lewis do it? There are lots of reasons, but let me just mention three. One is just fun. <laughs> Play. <laughs> when I mentioned what I discovered to a man who knew Lewis well in the 1950s, there are still people alive in England who remember him, uh, this man said to me, ah, yes, I can see Jack doing that. He would have roared with laughter as he did that. Lewis didn't have to do any great research to find all this symbolism. It was at, the finger, at his fingertips. He'd been immersing himself in this for decades. That's one not particularly important reason, just fun. The two more important reasons are literary and theological. The literary reason is the kappa element in romance. Lewis believed that a well-told tale should have not just a good plot, but a good atmosphere. And these seven spiritual symbols allow him to give both plot and atmosphere a particular tone or flavor or quality. You don't look at it as you read, you look along it. You just find yourself plunged into a jovial world, a martial world, a solar world, and so on, seven times over. It makes for a very rich and enjoyable and, and various reading experience. But this, the, the fundamental reason, I think, is theological. Lewis said that the whole Narnia series is about Christ. But how is it about Christ? It's not just through simple, one-to-one, -one, easy to spot biblical parallels from Aslan to the Bible. There's much more going on here. Lewis is wanting to depict the Christ who is the all-pervasive principle of cohesion in him in whom we live and move and have our being. Yes, he's located, he's summed up, he's incarnated in Aslan, this divine character, but he's also spread abroad across the rest of the tale. And the children, as they interact with the Christ character, grow up into this spirit themselves. They take on their divine properties. That, I think, is the fundamental reason why Lewis did this the way that he did, and why he kept it secret. Because we can't see God on that large scale. He escapes us like the large words on a map. We can see him, however, located in Jesus Christ, and that is enough. Neither too big nor too small, just right. But another reason, I think, why Lewis kept this uh, scheme secret is as a kind of a deeply laid, uh, long-fused uh, kind of imaginative depth charge, so to speak. He was prepared to be misunderstood. He was prepared for even close friends like Tolkien to dismiss the Narnia Chronicles as a hodgepodge. Just as God is prepared for us to disbelieve in him and for us to question his purposes when we sometimes think, that there's no divine authorship working itself out in this seemingly chaotic universe. We are free to make that judgment. God will not force himself upon us. He would not be loving to force himself upon us. Lewis is to Narnia as God is to the world. Lewis knows what he's up to, but he's not going to force his design upon the reader. You've got to want it. <laughs> You've got to go looking for it. And, as I have said, lots of Lewis scholars have been sniffing around this mystery for decades. When we understand what Lewis is really up to, we see there are no accidents in Narnia, but everything is coherent and designed. Down to the curve of every wave and the flight of every insect, down to the choice of even a discarded chess piece. It's amazing. <laughs> the man was genius. Absolutely brilliant. That's enough for me. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully that has piqued your interest and hopefully you have some questions. So just for a short period of time, if you do have questions, if this mic is up and running, uh, I would like for anyone who has a question to go to this mic. If it's difficult for you to get there, I understand because it's crowded, then please just stand, state your question loudly. 
and uh, Professor Ward will be happy to answer. Yeah, fire away. Anybody got anything they want to ask? Yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if, uh, I guess he had in mind writing all seven books right from the beginning. I always thought it was just sort of, you know, I'm going to write the sequel. That type of thing. The question is whether he had all seven books in mind when he started. And actually, he didn't. No. He says quite clearly in a letter that when he started out, he only had one book in mind. He didn't know there was going to be a whole series. And some people have said to me, well, doesn't this frustrate the, the argument? But my argument isn't that he had a seven-book series in mind. My argument is that he started out wanting to write a Jupiter story. He, <clears throat> he wanted to write a jovial-themed story because who does not need to be reminded of Jove? That's one reason. Partly because he himself used jokingly to say that he'd been born under Jupiter in his university lectures. He would often say, those born under Jupiter are apt to be loud-voiced and red-faced and jolly, and he would then pause and add, it is obvious under which planet I was born. Because <laughs> he himself was, just like that. A uh, florid face with a booming voice and a hearty laugh, a very jovial character. Um, so he sets out with the intention of writing one jovial book. And having written one, he tries a second, and then a third and then a four. And I think it was apparently only after he'd written four that he decided he was going to do all seven. So the, the series did indeed grow incrementally, uh, but it's worth pointing out that he, he, had, he had actually finished the first four books before he published the first. Uh, so he was able to go back and make adjustments for the series once he knew there was going to be a series. When I wrote the line, I did not know it was going, I was going to write any more. Yeah. Then I wrote Caspian and the sequel, and still didn't think there would be any more. Yeah, that's right. But after four, it seems that he made up the, his mind. But he doesn't say in that letter that actually the second book that he began writing was not Prince Caspian, but actually the magician's nephew. That was the second book he started. But he couldn't find the right shape for the magician's nephew, so he set it aside. And actually the magician's nephew was the last book that he completed. That was the sixth book that he published. So the order in which he began them, the order in which he published them, the order in which they relate to the order of learning history, they're all different. So in that sense, the, the series did grow in an unplanned way, yes. But each particular book, I think, is very carefully planned within itself. Yes, sir? If I could ask uh, that you comment a bit further on the twiddlings. Uh, I'm curious whether there's any aspect that you feel is relevant with respect to when I think of twiddlings, I think of when I'm trying to work something bigger out in my mind. And so is there any way in which there's a connection between Lewis's uh, struggles to categorize and understand the literature of the 16th century mm. in this philosophical perspective that was commonplace at that time mm. and an attempt, just as you were saying, um, through the learning stories to bring a religious aspect to those, to also somehow capture yeah. these philosophical underpinnings of the 16th century mm. in the Christological story. Yeah. And, and did so through the working out of, of these sort of bedtime tales. Yeah. I hope you heard enough of that. The, the question is really how, how does the, uh, the 16th century volume that he wrote relate to Narnia and the other books that he said were, the, were its little twiddly bits. And I think, yes, you're, you're right that uh, the twiddly bits are in large part um, sort of convenient distractions through, but by means of which he can, he can play out some of the ideas that he's working at as an academic. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. The, uh, it's not just the Narnia Chronicles either, but um, the Screwtape Letters, the Mere Christianity Broadcast, the Abolition of Man, and a good deal of those other, you know, the other famous book, the other books for which he's now much more famous, were written during those 15 years. And they were all sort of the, the outflow, the little excrescences upon his professional occupation. Yeah. Uh, the little tings on the triangle, the little piccolo flourishes. Uh, you know, little excrescences. 
but of course, <laughs> it's, it seems bizarre to talk about the Nine Chronicles, these works of absolute genius as excrescences. Uh, but that, at any rate, is how Lewis seems to have conceived of them. Yeah, they were, you know, things he did in his off hours, in his leisure time. Yeah. <coughs> Yes. Um, I so you first published Planet Narnia in two thousand seven uh, or eight. Eight. Okay. Because yes. I got to hear you speak at Kentucky Christian University back in two thousand eight, mm. and I'm just wondering about the time since then. I'm sure you've had people push back on your theory, and I'm wondering if any of those stand out, and if you've been able to kind of talk back to like what are the biggest criticism has been. Thank you. The question is about whether I've had pushback from other critics. I'm pleased to say that most. Uh, Lewis scholars seem to be pretty persuaded. <coughs> I haven't had much pushback at all, um, I'm pleased to say. Uh, lots of Lewis scholars have said, how did we miss this? Because <laughs> once you see it, it's impossible not to see, I think. But there have been only two scholars, really, who have made any serious attempt, I think, to engage and push back. One is a, a chap called Justin Barrett. Um, his is the most serious interaction with the case. He, he subjected my argument to uh, quantitative analysis. <laughs> he, put, he put my argument basically through a number cruncher. Uh, and he wrote a good article about that, and I wrote, wrote a response to his article. Uh, and you can see both articles on the website of the Wade Center at Wheaton College, if you want to follow up that. Um, Another scholar called Devin Brown from Asbury, I think he is, um, has said, but aren't you just cherry picking your, your symbols, your, your moments? Because, I mean, look at Prince Caspian. At the end of Prince Caspian, there's that lovely moment when all the children snuggle up to Aslan and they fall asleep, and Aslan spends the entire night staring at the moon. Staring at the moon, not at Mars. Uh, so, how can this be a martial episode? which is a you know, fair enough question on the surface, but it overlooks two things. First of all, all the events ha have to happen either during the day or during the night. <laughs> and the sun rules the day and the moon rules the night. Does that mean the other five planets never get a look in? Of course not, because each planet represents the other in, in, in an appropriate conjunction. <laughs> uh, the other thing he overlooks is the fact that Aslan <coughs> stays awake while everybody else falls asleep. Now that is a peculiarly martial quality. And if you look at Lewis's descriptions of Mars elsewhere, he will often talk about Mars as the vigilant one, who keeps the vigil, who does not sleep, who is like a sentry on a castle wall, keeping guard over the camp. It's a peculiarly martial quality that Aslan exhibits in that moment while he's looking at the moon. Now, if, if Lewis had Aslan staring all night unblinkingly at Mars, <laughs> he would have felt odd. That, that's too obvious. That, that's making things too clear. Lewis is like a, I sometimes use this image of, uh, of the chef, of the cook, adding salt to a, to a dish. You want to add just enough to bring out the flavor, but not so much that it only tastes of salt. And that's exactly what he's doing there. So I, I respect uh, Devin's um, questions, but I think he hasn't really asked them quite thoroughly enough. Yes, sir. Um, any thoughts about the order of the books? I mean, I know we said he didn't necessarily know what he was writing when mm. he started, mm. but in terms of what book he wants to write next, because um, yeah. they're, they're not in ascending order. No, they're not. Um, here, here is the picture again. So he starts out with the Jupiter book, and Jupiter is the best planet. That's why he wants to start with that. It's the one which is, he thinks, most in need of imaginative rehabilitation in the Saturnine <coughs> 20th century. But inconveniently, Jupiter is neither the first planet nor the last planet. So it's not like he could start at the top and work his way down, or start at the bottom and work his way up. He, he, he's starting with the sixth place planet. So where does he go after that? Uh, anyway, it's interesting to me that he, that he did turn to the Magician's Nephew second. And the Magician's Nephew, being the Venus book, is, is the book of the second best planet. Venus is uh, Fortuna Minor, as <coughs> Jupiter is Fortuna Major. So there's a, you might say there's a bit of a, an obvious order in that choice. But 
I've not myself been able to work out any particular pattern to the series, except that he starts with the best Jupiter and he ends with the worst Saturn, and they bookend the series quite nicely. The intervening five, if there is a pattern to those, um, I've not been able to work out what it is. But I wouldn't be surprised if there is a reason, because the more I've tried to follow in Lewis's footsteps, imaginatively speaking, the more I've discovered that whenever you can, you sort of find a reason it is there to be found. And it's just maybe the case that you know the key letter where he gives the game away hasn't survived, or the key conversation where he might have mentioned the ordering was never recorded. So there are, there are certain things which are just lost to the mists of time, I think. Um, but the level of detail that he does go into is really staggering at times. And it's been delightful when I've been able to you know, trace it out. Yes, sir? Do we know what Charles Williams thought of the Narnia Chronicles? Well, he didn't live to see them, actually, because Williams died in 1945. Uh -huh. And they weren't published until the 50s. Do you think that he owes anything to Williams, the, the idea of the coherence and the... Yes, quite possibly. Uh, the coherence, the, um, the idea of participating in one another's burden, or, yeah, participating in one another's burdens, you might say, is, a, is an aspect of the, uh, the, the spirituality of theosis, to, to give the, the, the technical term, by, by means of which the children begin to participate in the divine attributes. You could say that's a kind of coherence itself. Um, the, the most particular connection I've seen between Williams' influence on Lewis and the Narnia Chronicles is in The Magician's Nephew, because there's a lot of Williams' uh, understanding of Venus in, at work in The Magician's Nephew, I think. Yes, sir? My fantasy dinner includes Jack Lewis and Gene Roddenberry, and you. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of conversation do you imagine the two of them having? Uh, Gene Roddenberry is the Star Trek guy? Star Trek. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> who, who utilizes a lot of the classicism uh, resource yes. in a number of Star Trek episodes. Yes. And in sequence, I doubt that uh, Lewis was affected by Gene Roddenberry, but, uh, <laughs> but I really suspect that Gene Roddenberry was influenced by Lewis. I have a long conversation with Gene Roddenberry by phone. I wish I had thought to ask him that. Yeah. But what, what, where do you think that conversation would go between the two of them? I honestly don't know. I mean, Lewis did pay quite a lot of attention to uh, science fiction developments in the, in the 20th century. Um, he, he subscribed to you know, American magazines of science, science fiction uh, and kept a watching brief on developments in America. But, but, but did Roddenberry ever write books or was he only ever in television? Because, uh, I mean, Lewis was never a television watcher. Yeah. So I don't uh, suppose there was much of a question. Primary television after some other, uh, earlier uh, jobs. Yeah. But his description, he's a Presbyterian layman. Right. He says, Star Trek is my pulpit. Yeah. And he could, could and did address every moral yeah. issue you can name yeah. with, a, with a resolution that, if not overtly Christian, uh, at least was compatible. Yeah. Uh, I, just, I just really believe that he had read enough Lewis mm. to, to, to take his. Yeah. Well, quite, well, quite, train to the quite possibly, quite probably, uh, but I don't think Lewis, Lewis never refers to Gene Wondry, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, the lady in the red oh, scarf. Oh, yes. So um, uh, you brought up some of the, the illustrations um, from the Chronicles of Maria to make those kinds of comparisons. Mm. To what degree do you think the illustrative process was inspired or has to be inspired by classical art, or is it purely just drawing off of clear imagery that Lewis had already set forth. Yes, I think it's, uh, it's just uh, the illustrator, Pauline Baines, uh, working to the text that Lewis provided her, and because she's a good illustrator, she brings out appropriate pictures. Okay. Uh, I actually wrote to Pauline Baines shortly after I had this idea and asked her if Lewis had ever said anything about it, and she said no, but then she had hardly any dealings with him at all. Uh, he just wrote the books, and the, it was really the publisher's job to send the books to Pauline Baines for her to do the job. 
And she has said that, you know, after he'd written the stories, he just thought it was someone else's job to do the pictures, and he didn't involve himself particularly in what she did. They didn't particularly get on on the one occasion they met. Um, <laughs> though Lewis did express pleasure in, in one or two of her illustrations in particular. Uh, and I've got, particular, I've got ideas about why he might have been pleased with the full-scale picture in the Prince Caspian. Um, but that's too detailed to go into now. Um, no, she was just a good illustrator. So, um, you know, that image I showed you from Prince Caspian of the single combat on the trees, it's a perfect combination of two important elements in the, in the text. It happens to be a perfect illustration of Mars, but that's, that's just because she knew the story well, and she, did her, she, served, she served the story well. Yes, sir. You talked about the symbolism between the planets in the book. Do you think that there's any like corresponding symbolism between like the specific characters? Like you said, how he wrote, C.S. Lewis like did things intentionally. Do you mm. think like he wrote things like intentionally? Like this is why this person from Chess Piece. Mm. This is why like uh, Susan does not return in the last battle. Like, mm. This is why he spun the wardrobe. Is there any corresponding to your research that you found? Between the characters and yeah. Is there any particular correspondence between individual characters and the planets? Well, um, to a certain extent, yes. I mean, the, the most obvious example I think would be uh, Puddle Glum uh, in the Silver Chair. He comes from the the race of marsh wiggles who do all the watery work in uh, Narnia. And so, and wateriness is a is a major lunar element, um, and his very name, Puddle Glum, is uh, suggestive of that. I think another example would be uh, Reaper Cheap. Uh, Reaper Cheap features in both Prince Caspian and the Dawn Treader <coughs> in a significant way. You you get a brief glimpse of him in the last battle, but he doesn't do much there. Uh, but the interesting thing is how his character changes between Prince Caspian and the Dawn Treader. Because in Prince Caspian, he's, he's constantly you know, trying to go into battle. Uh, he's described as a, as a martial mouse in Prince Caspian. But it's interesting in the Dawn Treader, when the uh, sea serpent attacks the ship, what does Reaper Cheap do? He, he says, don't fight, push. So in the, in the Dawn Treader, he's no longer martial. He's no longer fighting the, uh, the sea serpent, but he's, he's wise. He's, he's beginning to acquire the, the wisdom which the sun uh, symbolically provides for those who are under his influence. So that's an interesting little tweak to his, his personality, um, appropriate to the, to the theme of that, of that book, The Dawn Treader. And there are some other adjustments that you can see Lewis making to particular characters as they move from one story to the next, uh, which I think helps illuminate the, uh, the, the case I'm trying to make. Let's have one last question, because I should really be out of here by about 8.30. Uh, you, sir, in the, in the jump up. Yes. Um, so hearing all of this, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, the Cosmic Trilogy, yes. right, which at once has perhaps even more obvious planetary symbolism, but also, just from the reading I've done of it, maybe not as consummate, not as fulfilled, uh, because, of course, it only spends one book on one planet, another book on the other planet, and kind of sorts out all the rest of the last one. Yeah. Um, to your knowledge, based on the chronology of writing that and then writing this, um, was there a process that CS Lewis went through in kind of trying to articulate this, uh, this uh, of planetary symbolism that didn't work in the space trilogy and did this one, or do you think it was two equally fulfilled attempts? I think um, I would say two equally fulfilled attempts, but two very different attempts, because the, the way the planets are used in the trilogy is, is explicit. In Narnia, it's implicit. Uh, in the trilogy, the planets serve the, the underlying theme, which is the theme of, of gender. Masculine Mars in the first book, feminine Venus in the second book, and the third book begins with the word matrimony. Gender and marriage are the theme of the trilogy, and, and it's that underlying 
theme which the planets serve. Uh, in Narnia, it's, it's more sophisticated. The, the, the planets are themselves, in a sense, you might say the underlying theme. But, but the underlying theme turns to Christian effect in, in the transferred classicism way. Um, so it's just a different use to which they're being put. A slightly more, I think, a subtler, a more sophisticated use. You can see, I think, how you would, how Lewis progressed from the trilogy to the to the septet. Um, but one of the, you know, one of the reasons I think why this argument that I'm putting forward is is so believable is because we have all these other writings from C.S. Lewis's pen on the planets, not just in the trilogy, but in his poetry and in his academic writings and in his letters and his diaries. Uh, you can show very easily how he understood each of the planets whenever he referred to them. And you take all that information, you lay it against the Narnia Chronicles, and they suddenly click into focus in this amazing way. Um, but I would encourage people, if you don't know the trilogy, to read the trilogy. It's a, it's a really good book, a really good series of books, especially the third, That Hideous Strength. Mm -hmm. is one of my favorite Lewis books of all time. Yeah.